is good, Holla Squad. We are the little squad on the YouTube platform. This is day we are back with another reaction, and we got some more the fat electrician in the building. Now, this is American pilot obliterates five enemy planes in four minutes. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I ain't never seen a speed run done like this in my life. Hey yo, what is the hardest game y'all ever seen speed ran? <laughs> I don't know. Listen, but before we hop into this, make sure I like, comment, subscribe, all that great stuff. You know what I'm saying? Let's get it. I hate it when I start researching for a video and the truth ends up getting in the way of a good story. Luckily, oh. this is a good story regardless. Okay. <laughs> Today, we're talking about America's first naval ace of World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, Edward Butch O'Hare. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought Hold to up. Did they name the, the Chicago airport after him? Hold on. Huh? By Delete Me. Finally. Is that a CMMG descent? Come find out. Guys, I, uh, I, I gotta. He said, delete me, and she popped in with the blickster. That is insane. Go. Well, actually, hold on. What's it chambered in? It's 300 blackout. Yeah, I gotta go. Sorry about that. Anyways, delete me super <laughs> straightforward. You give them money, they make sure that all your personal information isn't being sold on the internet by data brokers. You see, data brokers are legally required to stop selling your information if you submit an opt-out request. However, submitting an opt-out request is different for every different data broker firm, and mm. they make it as difficult as possible, and delete me does all of it for you automatically. Then, after they do delete all your information from data brokers, they continue to monitor all of I need to do that because scam likely has been blinging my line, all right? data brokers in case your information does get relisted again they will automatically but shout out who, to whoever invented that automatically take it down again i like delete me a lot it's a service that i actually use i also just got my wife signed up for it a couple of months ago as you can see here they checked for 142 different data brokers mm. and 80 of them had her personal information and they show us what information that they had so if you wanted to give it a try i will have a link and a discount code down below let's get back to the video Easy Eddie, right? Now, our story actually begins with his father. So Sound like something people take right before they hit like EDC or something. Once upon a time in 1893, Edward Joseph O'Hare, EJ for short, was born in St. Louis, Missouri as a son of two first generation Americans that had just come over from Ireland. He spent his entire childhood in mm. St. Louis and then in 1912, he would meet his wife Selma. They would end up getting married and then they would live in an apartment above a grocery store that was owned by Selma's father. Okay. Shortly after that in 1914, Selma would give birth to their first child, Edward O'Hare, that would later come to be known as Butch. Butch would also get two little sisters, Marilyn and Patricia, and by all accounts, they had a really happy little family. Okay, fast forward 1923, EJ takes the Missouri State Bar, he passes it, becomes a lawyer, and almost immediately gets this new client by the name of Owen P. Smith, and he is okay. the commissioner of the Greyhound Racing Association for the entire nation. And he needs a lawyer because he needs to patent his new invention, that little electric rabbit that goes around the dog racing track that all the dogs chase. So EJ That's gets that for him, and then Owen decides that he wants to keep him around, so he makes him a business partner because he needs a good lawyer that's going to be able to help him keep dog tracks open and open up new dog tracks tracks because at this point in time dog tracks received a ton of political resistance and okay. this is because in 1910 gambling got outlawed so for the next decade all the dog tracks were just going out of business because without the gambling revenue coming in the business just wasn't financially viable and i mean nobody wants to go just watch dogs run in a circle if you're not betting money on it right if so facto all the dog tracks ended up shutting down except for the ones that were willing to engage in underground illegal gambling which is why they needed a good lawyer like ej but before ej even passed the bar and became a lawyer in 1923 things were already set into motion that would eventually change that you see 1920 was prohibition when the government banned alcohol yo Case. they were just speed running they got rid of liquor then they uh, or they got rid of gambling and they got rid of yo sidebar they were shutting the wild west down Okay. The amount of videos that I have done on this channel and my other channel, The Fat Files, where everything ties back to Prohibition is absolutely insane. Yep. It's like that game, you know, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. And wasn't one of the Kennedys? Hold on, hold up, hold up. Hey, listen, listen, I don't want no smoke, okay? I don't want no smoke. But, okay, was it uh, somebody, uh, how, how can I, hey, hey, y'all know what I'm trying to ask, okay? One of them came up during prohibition okay that's all i'm asking bacon, where every single person on the planet knows kevin bacon within six relationships i can do any historical event and tie it back to prohibition somehow in some way in some fashion i know it's possible take a look at this 
Jesus Christ. That, I mean, just off the top of my head from videos that I've already covered, Prohibition is directly well, we get on that one. for Domino's not going bankrupt in okay. 2012. Every American warship having an ice cream machine on it. That time that America had multiple ships completely dedicated to just making ice cream and distributing it to the Pacific Theater in World War II. The fact that there's 7 billion pounds of cheese in underground caves all over America. The fact that every dairy farmer is required by law to pay into a giant advertising fund so that they can advertise milk, which is where Got Milk came from. Pretty much mm. all the IRS codes regarding tax evasion. And now this, this story as well is also brought to you by Prohibition. The Prohibition. That one time that the US government tried to ban alcohol and failed miserably. Now, as we all know, after alcohol got banned, organized crime stepped in. They started distributing alcohol. They established speakeasies. They had bootleggers. They manufactured their own booze. And they Hold up. That's how speakeasies became a thing? Is people trying to do like underground like liquor drinking? Hold on. Hey, we learned this on that. Hey, a lot of money while they did it. And by 1925, they had gotten so wealthy and so powerful that they were actually able to buy off politicians and law enforcement. And they were able to get away with whatever they wanted. And they were looking for more ways to make even more money, whether it was legal or not. And one of the things they decided that they wanted to do was to get into gambling via dog racing tracks. And now mm. that they had politicians on their payroll, they would actually be able to get the building permits, build all new dog racing tracks and not be busted for gambling by the law enforcement because they were paying off them too. So you're a big time mobster that wants to get involved in dog racing money's not going to be an issue getting mm. building permits from politicians isn't going to be an issue and the law enforcement's going to leave you alone what's the last thing you need you need somebody that knows how to run a dog racing track and one of those okay. stupid electric rabbit things right right so that's what they do the mobsters go and they get a hold of owen smith and his legal consigliere ej o'hare and when i say mobsters i just mean the first big time guy to figure all this out and put the plan together and that was a gentleman from chicago by the name of al capone bro bro listen all i'm chicago O'Hare, they, hey, hey, listen, I, if I had to pull my parlay right now and say the name came from this, that's what I'm going to do. Now, I don't know. I might, I might get proven wrong, but let's see. Yeah. EJ and Owen are now partnered with We're Scarface. Crazy. Definitely looks suspicious and his Southern Italian heritage raises some flags. Using Capone's connections, they end up building dog tracks in Chicago, Miami, and Boston, and they make a ton bro bro okay of money and this goes on this for years insane. ej ends up earning his new nickname from the mob easy eddie and back at the o'hare mm. house they go from you know doing pretty okay financially to being very wealthy very quickly and despite ej easy eddie dad being in bed with the mafia and working with al capone when he's back home by all accounts he is a terrific father to all three of his kids and a great husband to his wife but butch his son is the absolute apple of his eye they have a really mm. special relationship using all this new money he has he goes up he takes him camping teaches him okay. how to shoot guns and then he even gets into flying airplanes loves taking butch up into the airplane with him and sometimes even letting him take control of the plane and butch falls in love with both flying and shooting guns oh, that's fine. and this goes on for years being a bad guy for a living and being a good dad back at home so fast forward 1927 owen p smith ends up passing away now since his business partner just passed away uh, he acquires that man. the business and the patent to the electric rabbit and this is where things get a little controversial depending on which source you want to read some sources imply that he swindled owen's widow out of the patent and out of the money and some mm. other sources say that he basically paid her out which to be fair both of those are completely possible he is a crooked lawyer working for the mafia True. and also it's pretty standard practice. i was gonna say if anybody was gonna get that from up under her it was the lawyer okay so look he might be a good guy he might be a bad guy who knows maybe he wrote it in previously Hey. I just said if you were in a business partnership and your partner passes away that mm -hmm. you buy out his shares and you acquire the entire Oh, they, he had that first or right refusal, you know what I'm saying on there? Hey, hey legal terms business. so you can go ahead and pick whichever one you like more for that now it's also at this point in time right around 1927 that easy eddie and his wife selma come to the realization that their son butch is adapting a little bit too well to their new life of luxury i mean they have enough money to give their kids anything they want the problem with butch is all he wants is to sit in the house read books and eat donuts three times a day <laughs> he's 13 years old and he's already starting to get fat and kind of lazy and one day he reaches peak laziness when he asks his mother at the age of 13 hey mom can i borrow the car to go to the bakery the bakery is literally Literally four doors down where he buys his donuts. What? He didn't want to walk like 60 feet to go get a box of donuts so he could eat it. At that point, his parents realized that they had a problem. <laughs> so they do what any good parents would do. They come to him with love and compassion and they hold his hand and they look deeply into his eyes and, and say, walk him, down to that baby. Okay, I'm just fucking kidding. They sent his ass straight to military school. It's a fat camp. Are you Bro, I remember I put my girl on a movie fat camp. Oh, she's asleep. She's not even hearing me, right? 
Yeah. She put me on. I watched Fat Cam for the first time this year, I think. Banger. Crazy? No way. So he gets shipped off to Western Military Academy in Illinois. Fast forward three years, 1930. Butch is in his junior year of military school, and he absolutely loves it. He's not much for conventional sports like football or wrestling. Mm. However, he did end up joining the water polo team, which he really enjoyed, and that's actually how he got his nickname, Butch. And he has decided not only does he enjoy military school, but he wants to go on to be in the actual military. He wants to go directly into the U.S. Naval Academy. So that's what Butch is up to. Easy Eddie's still just raking in the dirty gambling money with Al Capone, so much so that in 1930, he buys a massive mansion that mm. has an indoor skating rink and an indoor pool in this really fancy neighborhood in St. Louis. And this is the part where the truth kind of gets in the way of a good story, because when this story is usually told, there hasn't been all this context that I've already given you guys. It's okay. literally just, they open up like, hey, there was this lawyer that worked for the mafia and Al Capone. His name was Easy Eddie, and he was the best lawyer around, and he's the reason that Al Capone got kept out of prison, okay? Which, right out of the gate, that's not true, okay? Mm. Easy Eddie wasn't Al Capone's lawyer. He happened to be a lawyer that was a business associate of Al Capone, okay? If Al Capone got arrested for a DUI or he whatever, was not it hoping. wasn't like he was calling up Easy Eddie to come represent him mm. in court. That never happened. Hey, hey, but Easy Eddie was helping him get that bread to pay whatever lawyer was getting him out of so it's basically the same thing. Then go on to explain that him and his son Butch have this amazing relationship and Butch is the apple of his eye and he uses the wealth that he's accrued from working with the mafia to give his son everything he could possibly want. And then one day he has a change of heart and realizes that he hasn't given his son a good role model in life to look up to. And at that moment he decided that he was going to help the IRS put Al Capone in prison, proving to his son how to be a good person. And then the mafia assassinates him for it. And then his son, having seen his father lay down his life to do the right thing decides that he's going to go off and become a war hero in World War II and it's this happy story about redemption and doing the right thing and it's also completely fucking made up and nonsensical. Bro, if that was a real story though, that'd be crazy. Okay, that story sounds great if Butch is like a seven-year-old little boy. He's not. He's 17 and he's been in military school mm. since he was 13 and he's already about to go into the U.S. Naval Academy, okay? Do you know how fucking mad I would be if my dad that I had a great relationship with, like one of my best friends that I confided in at the age of 17, mm. and he came to me and was like, son, I've done some pretty bad things in my life and I've decided to prove to you how to be a good man. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and turn myself in and get myself assassinated by the mob just to show you how to do the right thing. You know what I mean? Like, hey, dad, counter offer, hear me out. What if you just retired? You're already rich, and then you just stopped doing bad stuff. True. That would a pretty good example. I'm also 17, so I don't need you to just like set the example. I'm old enough and mature enough to understand the concept of like, hey, do as I say, not as I do. You know, maybe don't go get yourself killed basically for no reason. This city wept. We lost two heroes. It wasn't even an awning in their direction. No, I know. Jump 20 stories. Doesn't make sense, does it? So again, that's complete nonsense fairy tale land. Not only is it not historically supported, it also doesn't even make sense if you understand people even a little bit. Okay, so here's what actually happened. In 1930, Easy Eddie does start working with the IRS because he's running all the dog tracks. He's helping Al Capone cook the books and basically launder all the money. And he's going to be able to show okay. the IRS how he's doing it, which is going to be able to allow them to put Al Capone in prison for tax evasion. Now, from here, there's another myth that honestly, I also don't buy. Mm. But basically, they insinuate that Easy Eddie actually helped the feds put away Al Capone in exchange for guaranteeing that his son, Butch O'Hare, got into the U.S. Naval Academy. Okay, and again, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they thought we was born at night or during the day. But whoever came with that story definitely believes it was last night or yesterday, okay? It's no way. I don't know where this myth came from. I don't know why people believe this. There's almost no historical evidence that supports it. And if you think about it, it doesn't even make sense, okay? The U.S. Naval Academy has like a 10 to 12% acceptance rate. And mm. Butch O'Hare just spent the last five years in one of the most prestigious military academies in the United States. True. And he performed well there. He's pretty much guaranteed a slot at the U.S. Naval Academy at this point. And we know how he performed once he got into the U.S. Naval Academy and there was nothing that even remotely suggested nepotism belong there. So exactly. if he was going to get in anyways, why on earth would Easy Eddie go 
get Al Capone turned in and get himself killed for no reason. So what do I think happened? I think that it was 1930 and Elliot Ness and his crew of uncorruptible cops known as the Untouchables were going around putting all the mobsters in jail and Al Capone was number one on their list and Easy Eddie being the intelligent guy that he was mm. realized that if they got Al Capone and then they would just start working their way down the ladder and they would eventually get to him too. So he figured, hey, maybe I should help them get Al Capone and then I'll get my own freedom. Oh, so it's un undisputed that he definitely helped them instead now in addition to this to be fair to the myth that i did just try to debunk it would not surprise me if there was some portion of this conversation where easy eddie was like hey i'm willing to be your guys's informant my son is applying for the u.s naval academy if for some reason that it gets brought up that his dad is a famous mafia guy that works for al capone mm. and that is going to prevent him from getting in for that reason alone i need you guys to tell them that i don't actually work for the mafia anymore and i'm working for you as an informant that way my son gets what he deserves Okay, mm. that is a very, very big difference between he got his son in by turning in Al Capone and he got out of his son's way while also saving his own skin, which was probably his primary goal to begin with. Regardless, Al Capone gets arrested and put in jail for tax evasion in 1931. Then That's in crazy. 1932, Butch sets off for the U.S. Naval Academy. Bro, somebody give me a fire video on Al Capone. I know a little bit. Okay, I knew the tax evasion thing. I learned that in fifth grade. Okay, uh, and then um. I don't really know that much else. So I need to tap in. While attending the academy, Butch does a great job and goes back home every chance he gets to hang out with his mom, his dad, and his two sisters. Now, right around this time, Easy Eddie and Selma end up getting a divorce, and Easy Eddie actually moves to Chicago so he can be closer to the racetrack that he's running. Okay, oh, fast here. forward to 1937. Butch graduates from the Naval Academy, and he decides that he wants to go off to become a pilot. Here's the problem. You can't just go off to become a pilot right after becoming a commissioned officer after graduating from the academy. You have to serve a minimum of two years in the Naval Surface Fleet, so mm. he sets off to do that serving his two years on the battleship, the USS New Mexico. So he does that for the next two years while dad is back home running the dog tracks in Chicago. Then 1939 rolls around. He's done his two years worth of time in the surface fleet. He applies to get into Naval Aviation School and he gets accepted. And right as he is about to ship off to go become a pilot, he receives word that his father has been murdered on November 8th, 1939. Easy Eddie had just left his office at the dog track in Chicago and was mm. driving home. And when he pulled up to a stoplight, two armed gunmen got they figured out, out who it was, man. shotgun and opened fire on him inside of his car. Eddie tried to escape, but he was shot multiple times and ended up veering off and crashing into a light pole and mm. he would pass away almost immediately from his wounds. Now, technically, we don't actually know who killed Eddie. This is considered a cold case. However, pretty Come much everybody now. agrees that it was a mafia because he was assassinated approximately one week before Al Capone was set to get out of prison from the tax evasion charges that Eddie helped with in the first place. So everybody just kind of assumed that this was Al Capone's gift for getting out of prison. Now, going back to my original. How's that a gift? Anger with. Oh, like a welcome home gift. Like, hey, boss. Welcome back. You know what I'm saying? The guy who got you in there, we got him out of here. The okay, oversimplified maybe. version of the story from blogs and newspapers and magazines and other YouTube videos. When they tell the story, it's like Easy Eddie helps turn in Al Capone and then he is assassinated for it. They fail to mention that he's assassinated like nine years later, okay, mm. which I feel is kind of an important detail. Okay, setting that aside, Butch takes emergency leave. He comes back home. He buries his father. And this is obviously extremely hard to do because that's his dad that died. But to make it even worse, the newspaper and the media is dragging his father and by extension his entire family completely through the mud. Damn. You gotta remember this is the 1930s. The anti-mafia sentiment is at an all-time high and because of this the newspapers and the law enforcement hype anything up they possibly can to make the American public feel safer. They want them to Hold feel up, like said the, the what? any other and by extension his entire family completely through the mud. You gotta remember this is the 1930s. The anti-mafia sentiment. 1930s? Did it? Okay look. Wasn't Rudy Giuliani the one who made the, the 1930, how old is he? It is an all-time high, and because of this, the newspapers and the law enforcement hype anything up they possibly can to make the American public feel safer. They want them to feel like the war against organized crime is being won, and in this case, they hyped up Eddie to be something 
a lot more than he was. This is where the myth that Easy Eddie was the mastermind criminal genius lawyer that kept the entire mafia out of prison came from. That's how the media portrayed mm. him after his death. And did Easy Eddie do some bad stuff? Yeah, absolutely. He enabled the mafia to make money from illegal gambling at dog racing tracks, and he made a bunch of money in the process as well. However, at no point was he the evil mastermind that was keeping Al Capone and all the mobsters out of jail. And having mm. the newspapers vilify him to that degree was devastating to Butch and his family. I mean, yeah, he did some bad things, but he was a great dad to them, and from their perspective, he probably did those bad things to provide for his family. Whether that's right or wrong is a different conversation, but to them, he was still their hero. He was a great guy in their eyes. Not only did they have to deal with the emotional and mental stress of that, but they were also- Listen, all I'm saying is, all of this is leading up to an American pilot obliterates five enemy planes in four minutes, okay? Now, this happening to his dad, if that's about to turn him into Star Fox, hey. Starting to get treated different by their community because now the entire community was looking down on them because Easy Eddie was apparently this evil criminal mastermind and all the money they have and all the fancy cars and the big house was clearly blood money and now nobody liked the family either. At this point in time, it would appear that the last name O'Hare was forever going to be associated with the mafia and looked down upon forever. Now, I don't know this for sure because Butch never wrote about it, so I can't truly know his intentions. However, putting myself in his situation, I have to assume that he felt like his dad was in fact a good guy that was driven mm. to do bad things for the right reason. Being in Butch's shoes, that's his dad, it was his best friend, it was his hero. Realizing that his dad had done horrible things to put Butch in the advantageous position that he was in now, having gone through military school, having graduated the U.S. Naval Academy, and now being headed off to flight school, Butch couldn't afford to waste the opportunity. His dad had become a villain so that Butch had the opportunity to become a hero. Okay. So Butch does the only thing he can do. He goes back out to flight school. While there, he does okay in the classroom. He's not the best at taking written tests. But when it comes to actually getting Butch inside the planes, he is exceptional. He's one of the Falcon. best pilots they've ever seen. And he's even better at gunnery. This guy can put rounds on target with his eyes closed. He graduates from flight school in May of 1940. Then he gets stationed on the USS Saratoga, an aircraft carrier with VF-3. Okay, now at mm. this point, we got to remember it's early 1940. World War II has officially started, but America is not directly involved yet. That being said, pretty much everybody in the military is aware that America is going to be involved soon and they are training extra hard to get ready for that as well as training as many new recruits as possible. So all of America's best warfighters at this point in time are pretty much sent in to go train as many new guys as possible and the man in charge of VF3 to get all these new guys trained up and ready for war is a legendary pilot by the name of John Thatch. And this man is a complete badass. He is basically Maverick from Top Gun except in the <laughs> 1930s and I gotta watch this Top Gun, I never watched all them. the new guys that came through VF3 and it was his standard practice to take the best cockiest new pilots they had and he would take them up into the air in F4F Wildcats and have a mock dogfight with them and he would allow the cocky new guy to get the advantageous position on him just to shake them off get behind them and shoot them down first just to show them how good they're not just the complete dad energy if we're gonna okay okay all my military people how do you have a mock dogfight how do you know if you're like hitting the person? They got like pellets or something? Set a tone right now out of the gate. You're not that good. You're going to shut up. You're going to listen to what I have to tell you because it's the best chance you have at making it through this war that we have coming up. The dude is out there right now just breaking egos for a living until one day there's a new pilot that shows up. He's not particularly cocky, but he's highly regarded Butch as one of the best they have. Junior. And Thatch wants to take him up in the air just to see what he has. And he does what he always does. He lets them get the advantageous position, except this young pilot by the name of Butch O'Hare is so good that Thatch can't shake him. Now, Thatch is a better pilot overall, but O'Hare is so close in talent to Thatch that if Thatch does give up the tactical advantage, he's not able to recover. After mm. seeing how incredibly talented Butch is, Thatch decides to take him under his wing and becomes his mentor. So they train a ton. It's that, that Yoda and Luke, the Mickey and Rocky type relationship. And one of the things that they start doing is they start trying to address the issues that they know they're going to run into once the war starts. And the big issue right off the bat is Japan's new fighter plane, the Mitsubishi Zero that came yep. out in 1940. It is fast and more maneuverable than the Grumman F4F Wildcats by a long shot. Okay, this means not only does the Zero have the edge in combat, it also means that the F4F Wildcats can't really run away because the Zeros will just chase them down and shoot them out of the sky. Yep. So Thatch, being the tactical genius that he is, realizes the only chance they're going to have is to fight. This situation is kind of like when he first met Butch and took him up into the sky. Thatch is a better pilot than Butch. However, if he was able to give up that small advantage, he wasn't able to recover. He needs to find whatever that small advantage 
advantages that the F4F Wildcat has over the Zero so that he can enable his men to win. And what he comes mm. up with is a tactic that would later come to be known as a Thatch Weave. It's basically a counterpunch because he knows the Zeros are gonna end up behind the Wildcats. They're faster, they're more maneuverable. Once a Wildcat has a Zero on its tail, another Wildcat's gonna pull up next to it and then they're gonna cross paths and then they're gonna cross paths a second time, kind of like a zipper. Okay. And right as they're about to cross paths a second time, the Wingman is directly lined up with the broadside of the enemy Zero and he's gonna be able to open fire without running the risk of shooting down his friend. So it looks good on paper, but obviously- Bro, this is literally, that looked like, what's that water sport where they put their legs outside the water and they do the little, bro, they was going in the, Hey, man. Gotta see if it works in real life. So he calls upon his protege, young Butch O'Hare, to go up with a bunch of other planes to be the bad guys and try to chase down him and his guys where he can test the tactic. And it works out great. Butch was not able to shoot down any of them. The Thatch Weave would then be proven combat effective at the Battle of Midway, and it is still considered a viable dogfighting tactic to this day. Mm. During all this training, Butch would actually get some time off. He goes out, meets a young woman by the name of Rita, and on their very first date, he asked her to marry him, and she says yes, because Butch Butch O'Hare doesn't miss. They what? Yo, listen, all y'all that's 45,000 dates saying on Tinder, you're done. Y'all not no real lovers for real, man. This man first date said, will you marry me? Hold on. Then go, they have a honeymoon in Hawaii. They come back and they start living together in Coronado, California, while VF3 is stationed at North Island Naval Center. And while he lived there, everything went great. He was training a ton. He was busy, but he did get to go home to his new wife every single night. And then one day, Thatch decided to make everybody in VF3 come in for extra training on what appeared to be a random Sunday in December of 1941. And they did their training in the morning. Thatch cut everybody loose for lunch and they were supposed to report back to finish training that night Supposed and as butch o'hare was driving to his apartment to meet up with his wife for lunch over the radio he would find out that pearl harbor had been attacked he gets home he tells his wife and i quote the japanese have attacked pearl harbor i'm to board the saratoga as soon as possible it's war that's crazy the very next day the u.s imagine hearing that from like your significant other man that's a hey, look military wives that stay home got to be some of the strongest people i've ever seen in my life man a saratoga and vf because boy ain't no way you're not coming home. What? What? Three set off from North Island to go participate in World War II. On their way there, the world would find out about Wake Island, where 450 Marines and 1,200 civilian construction workers fought off the yep, Japanese we, we on seen a small that. coral atoll that the Japanese wanted to use as a forward operational base. In the initial defense of Wake Island, the Marines and the construction workers were able to sink two enemy destroyers and a submarine, repelling their entire force. And this is looked at as America's first victory over Japan. And it was a silver lining that the entire country looked to in the mm. days after Pearl Harbor. Because of this, America would immediately send ships to reinforce Wake Island. However, the ships that were leaving Pearl Harbor had a humongous head start. Amongst the American ships making their way there was Butch O'Hare and the USS Saratoga, as well as the rest of VF3. Unfortunately, the American leadership would come to the realization they were not going to be able to beat the Japanese there and they didn't want to risk losing any more ships than they already had in Pearl Harbor and they were ordered to back off and not try mm. to save the Marines and the construction workers at Wake Island. After two weeks of fighting, the Marines and the construction workers were forced to surrender. Those that did not die in combat were either executed or held as POWs for the remainder of World War II. Because of how brutally the Japanese treated the civilian construction workers, the American government realized that they couldn't rely on civilian contractors to do all their construction on forward operational bases in the future and this is where the navy's construction battalion was originally founded aka mm. the seabees and those civilian construction workers that were at wake island are considered to be america's first honorary seabees during the same time the uss saratoga would be crippled by an enemy torpedo and vf3 would have to rotate and now be stationed on the uss lexington once there it is the lexington's mission to penetrate deep into enemy territory so they can attack the port at rabul they get like 450 miles away and all of a sudden a Japanese recon plane spots them. So they send some fighters up. Thatch himself shoots down this enemy recon plane. But he didn't get to him fast enough because they got that he radio got transmission out and the Japanese bombers are already on the way to hit the USS Lexington. They start getting fighters up in the air as fast as they can as nine Japanese G4M Betty bombers show up and some of the fighters are Betty, already what? starting to engage the bombers, shooting them down. And Butch O'Hare is the last man slotted to get up in the air. He's sitting there on the flight deck in his Wildcat, fully fueled up as the bombers are coming in getting attacked by the other wildcats and he's just waiting his turn to get up in the air hoping that the bombers <laughs> don't make it and bomb the uss lexington with him right on top of it in a fully fueled up aircraft by the time butch gets up in the air the combat's basically over the bombers have been repelled and most of the wildcats are still chasing them down and they end up shooting down all of them and then 
a second wave of bombers gets detected oh on my. radar, and this is a humongous problem. You see, all the wildcats are up in the air, and most of them have, have been them in the air so long that they're out of ammo yep. and fuel. And once those planes return from chasing down that first wave, they're going to have to land. They're not going to be able to fight. By the time that second wave gets close, the only planes available with fuel and ammunition able to fight are Butch O'Hare and the guy that went up right before. Yo, don't tell me. My man is about to take out the whole... He bought the squad wife. He said, look, y'all ain't saved me no kills in the first round. <laughs> I'm about to get in my bag. <laughs> nah, this is, yo, nah, Bush about to go crazy, man. He's about to go crazy. For him, Duff to fill up. So what do you do? They do the only thing they can do. Butch and Duff get next to each other and they are about to engage nine Japanese mm. bombers in a double V formation. And Butch fires his guns just to make sure they're all working, standard procedure. Duff goes to fire his. All of them are jammed. Nah, there's no way. There's no way he bought the 1v9? What? So Duff's out. It is now Butch O'Hare versus an entire formation of Japanese bombers all by himself. He's already running low on fuel, and he only has enough ammunition for 10 three-second bursts with his guns. He does not have enough ammunition to take down all of these planes, and mm. even if he did, he doesn't have the time to do it all by himself. He needs to be as accurate as humanly possible, and that's exactly what he does. Using his expertise in gunnery, he is engaging engines and fuel tanks, and that is it. On his first pass, he manages to knock two bombers out of the formation. He then immediately goes into a second pass, engaging the first bomber he sees on the other side of the formation, critically damaging it as well, forcing it to drop its bombs early and peel away. He then engages the next bomber next to it, striking the fuel tank, causing it to blow up in midair. He immediately goes into his third pass, shooting down another two bombers before making his fourth pass, engaging another one. And while this is happening, the crew of the USS Lexington is just watching in awe as it unfolds before them. Watching? Refuel your planes, buddy, okay? The Admiral on board said, and I quote, All of us on the flight deck and the bridges became so intent watching the aerial battle that it was hard for us to concentrate on our duties. At the time, the entire ship's company burst into cheers as our fighter shot the bombers down into the sea. It was not as though they were in the midst of a life or death struggle, but at a baseball game. That's crazy. After his fourth pass, Butch was completely out of ammunition and almost out of fuel. The four remaining Japanese planes dropped their bombs and all of them missed. <laughs> all right, all right. That was so hard. In the span of four minutes, Butch O'Hare had pulled off the impossible, going toe to toe with an entire Japanese bomb. He got formation. five and kills out of him. He was everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. The entire bombing formation returning fire on Butch managed to hit him with a total of one bullet. Butch was engaging the enemy so quickly from so many different angles that one of the surviving Japanese hey, pilots said, and I quote, enemy planes swirled around us, zooming, banking, dying. Look, bro, you know, you ever got beat up by one person and you think you got jumped, you like, oh my God. It says enemy planes swirled around us. By time the nine came, which is probably where this report came from, it was 1v9. That's crazy. Diving, attacking us from all directions, not realizing that it was one man. Bro. Maybe one man. So the four remaining Japanese planes that drop their bombs and missed, they peel off, they retreat. Butch goes to land, and as he goes to land, he drops his landing gear, and some new guy on the deck opens fire on him with a 50 caliber machine gun. Luckily, it was all misses. Butch gets out of his wildcat, walks up to the guy that was just shooting at him. It's some new kid that is now just shitting his pants because he almost just killed the hero of the day. And Butch walks up completely cool and he's like, son, I don't mind if you shoot at me. Just try not to do it when my landing gear's down. Which is probably the politest way of calling this kid an idiot to his True. face imaginable, considering that he just shot at him with a 50 caliber machine gun. Like, hey kid, if a plane has its landing gear down and you're on an aircraft carrier, it's probably trying to land on you, meaning it's not an enemy. Why would you shoot at me? <laughs> okay, now that the immediate threat is over, this has been like 30 minutes of straight How do you not see? We've got to figure out what all happened, where everybody's at, if they're okay. We have to get the planes ready in case there is another attack. There's a lot of stuff to do. So Butch, all the other pilots, and pretty much everybody else who would have seen anything goes in to get debriefed so the chain of command can try to figure out what all happened in this very busy couple of minutes. So Butch goes in and says, you know, I shot up seven of those planes really good. I'm pretty sure I downed six of them. To which the captain of the USS Lexington is like, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and only 
only credit you with five because after you pulled off after your last run, there was still four bombers in the air that dropped their bombs and there was originally nine to begin with. I do think that you shot down the other five though because well, pretty you much only went up there. Happen. So now Butch has officially been credited with downing five enemy planes. This makes him an ace pilot and the first naval aviator ace of World War II. And at Crazy. first, Butch doesn't think anything of it. He doesn't regard himself as being special. He doesn't think what he did was incredible. He thought he did exactly what anyone else in VF3 would have done <laughs> if they were in the exact same situation. As far as Butch O'Hare is concerned, the only thing about that day that was unique to him was that he happened to be in the right place at the right time. He wasn't necessarily the right guy. And then mm. he came out of getting debriefed and the crew of the USS Lexington had already went down to the machine shop and made him a trophy. He was everybody's best friend. He was the hero of the day that had saved the USS Lexington. That and boy everybody got the game ball. was in love with Butch O'Hare, America's first ace. The crew of the USS Lexington and the rest of VF3 actually adopted a new drinking song that night as well. It goes something along the lines of, O'Hare, O'Hare, did the Japanese bombers go? O'Hare, O'Hare, could they be? Okay, now sidebar, in the spirit of full disclosure, retroactively after World War II, it has been decided that Butch O'Hare actually only shot down three enemy bombers on that day. Apparently this is because hey, the Japanese documented that actually only three planes were shot down during that wave. Three of them returned back severely shot up and one of them apparently got lost in a storm. You sure about that? Okay, and this is where I get annoyed because on one hand, like, yeah, okay, I understand wanting to figure out the truth and clarify things, but also I feel like Americans typically tend to believe what the enemy says happened more than they believe the word of their own men. I mean, when the mm. captain of the USS Lexington looks up in the sky and he's like, one, two, three, there's four left. The rest were shot down. I don't know why we're not believing that guy. Why are we believing the Japanese documentation over that? And don't get me wrong. I understand that people make mistakes and maybe the captain miscounted. Maybe the entire crew that was also watching had a bad account of what happened, you know? Because maybe, maybe Butch had a bad, I mean, he was up there. He's, oh, there's one, there's two. Like, I feel like you would be, you know, hey. The enemy never ever makes mistakes, just like the enemy that was under the impression that he was getting attacked by multiple planes all at once <laughs> exactly. and they were everywhere all over the place, when in reality, it was just Butch up there by himself. Okay, and I know this is crazy and I'm definitely biased, but I'm always gonna be more inclined to believe the guys on my team than the enemy. But hey, mm. whatever, I'm not the expert, that's one thing, whatever. Maybe everybody on the USS Lexington miscounted and the Japanese counted right, I guess, that is possible. However, I will argue till I die that the Japanese pilot that got shot up by Butch O'Hare and then magically got lost in a storm that none of the <laughs> other shot up planes managed to get lost in absolutely got shot down by Butch O'Hare, okay? I don't care if the storm did the last 5% of the damage, Butch should get credit for that, okay? It's True. complete lunacy to say anything other other than that. I mean, for real, apply this logic to any other situation. Bro, it's like you're in Smash Bros, okay? You mink, 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 you hit somebody, and then the Yoshi's Island tree, or no, 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 who's, who's map is it? Kirby's Island tree blows them off the map. You you get the credit for that, that KO, you know what I'm saying? One stock less for them. Imagine that you're at a party and there's an altercation that breaks out between guy A and guy B and guy A pulls out a gun, shoots guy B in the chest 17 times, and then guy B falls into the pool. Okay. Are we going to be like, oh, that guy drowned? No, guy <laughs> A killed guy B. Okay. That's obvious. I'm sorry. I'm getting distracted. I get super annoyed when there's some people that have nothing better to do with their lives and look back and retroactively nitpick and try to undermine the accomplishments mm. of others. Honestly, Butch O'Hare probably wouldn't even care this much because all he cared about was saving his dudes, but also he's a better man than I am. So whatever, moving on. Anyway, so over the next couple of days, things kind of return to normal-ish. However, the USS Lexington is still on mission. They're still making their way to Rabul so they can attack this port. And then once they get there, they start launching raids. Now, Butch is pumped. He wants to get back up in the air. He wants more combat. That's what he's here for, right? However, it gets decided by Thatch that Butch and Duff are to stay at the USS Lexington while everybody else goes out and conducts raids. And the theory behind that was, or at least the stated theory as to what Thatch told O'Hare was, hey, we're leaving you guys to defend it because we know if everything goes bad, you two by yourselves can defend the USS Lexington <laughs> against anything. That's what Thatch told him. In reality, Thatch knew that Butch O'Hare was being put up for the Medal of Honor, and so did the rest of the chain of command, and they knew that they could not afford 
to let Butch get killed in combat. Okay, this is early 1942. This is two months after Pearl Harbor. The only silver lining, the only good news that America has gotten in the past 90 days was about the Marines and the construction workers making their last stand at Wake Island. Nice. And now they've all been captured, either killed or put in internment camps. Okay, America has not had any good news, except now they have the story of Butch O'Hare, the man that became an ace in four minutes. Shortly after That's this, Butch is informed that he's going to be receiving the Medal of Honor, to which he directly directly tells Thatch, I don't want it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want to have to go back stateside. He wants to stay out there with his men. He still does not feel as though he did anything special. And the man that has been his father figure, his mentor for the past couple of years, basically tells him, get your booty back there. Okay. And you can make your way back after you're done. Pats Butch on the shoulder and informs him too bad. Deal with it. You're a hero now. Now you got to go do that because that's ultimately what's going to be the best for this war effort. And with that, Butch is sent back home stateside where there is both a literal parade for him when he arrives and he is then metaphorically paraded around the country, mm. conducting interviews, doing anything he can to boost the morale of the American people and the military in the wake of Pearl Harbor. During this metaphorical parade, he makes his way to the White House where he is awarded the Medal of Honor by FDR and his very own wife, Rita, is the okay. one who gets to put it around his neck. And all of this is because he was just some fat kid from St. Louis that wanted some donuts but also didn't want to walk <laughs> very far to get him. And honestly, he's still that fat kid at heart. He's never been the star athlete. He's never had everybody looking at Bro, him. Bro, he O'Hare Airport, he was a pot, it has to be. That has, that makes me wonder like, I need to, I want to do some research behind the names of all the airports. Hmm. He's never stood in the spotlight for this long. And during this time, he is described as modest, humorous, inarticulate, very nice and more than a little embarrassed by the entire affair. So he gets paraded around the country helping to sell war bonds until about June of 1942. Then VF3 is actually set to come back to Hawaii for some R&R. &R. And while there, VF3's commander, John Thatch, is set to get a promotion and move on and advance his naval career. And mm. he is going to be replaced by none other than his protege and war hero, Butch O'Hare. On June 19th, 1942, Butch O'Hare formally relieves John Thatch of command of VF3 as he assumes command himself. John Thatch would then go on to say, and I quote, I know of no one I would rather see take my old command into new battles. Mm. Of course, referring to Butch O'Hare, and this meant more to Butch than winning the Medal of Honor. O'Hare. Unfortunately, this did not mean that Butch was going to get to go back into combat. VF3 had actually been taken and they are now going to be training all of the new oh, pilots okay. to get ready for war because America's practice at this point in time was to save all of our best pilots and make them teachers to train the next generation as opposed to the Japanese who, well, they used up all their good pilots. <laughs> <laughs> so Butch... Hey, nah, that, that, yo, that's crazy. And the remaining combat veterans of VF3 start training a bunch of new guys, and Butch officially becomes known as the King of Maui. Because, I mean, he's the war hero, everybody knows his name, he's training all the new guys, he's in charge, this guy is clearly the main character. And this is an important time because he's training the next generation of fighter pilots that he'll eventually take into combat, but he also gets to go home every night and spend time with his wife. Mm. And during this period, they end up having their daughter, Kathleen, that he gets to meet in March of 1943. With Butch leading all the training, VF3 became known as Butch's Boys, and a lot of these pilots went on to become aces themselves, and they all had incredible things to say about Butch and the lessons that he was able to pass on to them. Then in August of 1943, VF3 was reinstated as VF6, and they were being stationed on the USS Independence, and they were being sent back into the Pacific Theater for combat. But unlike last time, Butch isn't going to have a plane that's outmatched by Japanese Zeros, because him and his men are not getting Wildcats, they're getting the new Grumman F6F Hellcat. And I cannot stress to you enough what a big difference this is. The Wildcat is outmatched by Japanese planes. The Hellcat, on the other hand, will go on throughout the rest of World War II to rack up a 19 to 1 kill ratio. That's crazy. And now Butch and his boys got the new Hellcats and they proceed to go and fuck shit up. First thing they do is they go and they launch raids on Wake Island and Marcus Island. Butch lands a couple of more air-to-air -air kills, solidifying his status as an ace, even if people like to go back in time and try to discredit some of his kills. <laughs> then VF6, now VF3, gets restationed onto the USS Enterprise and Butch the war hero gets put in charge of all three squadrons mm. on the USS Enterprise. Okay, here's the problem with that. Butch is now officially a bigwig. He's not supposed to be out there in a Hellcat mixing it up with the enemy anymore. He's he supposed is. to be going up in like a Grumman Avenger, you know, a command plane so he can see everything, see what's going on, be protected, be safe, be the smart guy up in the tower telling the troops on the ground Come what on to now. do. Okay, but that's not he how not Butch gets like down, that. okay? He officially puts in a request that they repaint his Hellcat so that it can be his command and control vehicle and he's going to 
do everything from a Hellcat. And obviously, this is Butch O'Hare, the war hero and fighter ace. He's going to get what he wants, and he does <laughs> just that. Now, with Butch O'Hare in charge of over 100 pilots on the USS Enterprise, they go and provide air support to the Marine Corps as they make amphibious landings at Tarawa and Macon Island. And with mm -hmm. the help of the new Hellcats, they absolutely crush the Japanese in daytime combat. So bad that the Japanese have to ditch the idea altogether. After the Japanese realize they can no longer go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the American aviators during daylight, they resort to using night tactics. Basically, the Japanese resort to sending torpedo bombers out in the dark of night, <laughs> launching torpedoes, and hoping they hit American ships. Now, it's not super effective because the torpedo bombers can't really aim. However, it's also effective in that the Americans also can't really send planes up to stop them because night fighting at this point in time isn't really a thing. Okay, you gotta mm. realize this is 1943. Radars are still fairly new technology and they're mostly being used on ground arrays and recently they're starting to be used on big naval vessels they mm. can't cram one of these things inside of a fighter plane yet so at best all the americans can do is use the radar on the ship to see the enemies coming and then essentially brace for impact they are not going to be able to scramble their own fighters to go up without a radar because everything's relative up there right even if the ship tried to tell the planes where the enemy was like is that my left or your left is that my guy or is that an enemy they'd end up shooting more of themselves down than they would the enemy it'd be complete chaos so that's really all the americans can do is just hope they miss that was until butch came up with a plan what if we took the avenger it's a big plane we crammed a radar into that and then sent the avenger up with a bunch of hellcats and then as long as we could stay in formation we would be able to tell in relation to ourselves where the enemy was the avenger could be like the enemies to the left the enemies to the right and everybody has the same left the same right the avenger could guide everybody now obviously if the entire thing devolves into a giant dogfight, we're gonna have a huge issue but we should be able to Facts. ambush them under the cover of night and stay in formation and hopefully not lose it. And we don't need to go chasing kills. We just need to prevent them from launching torpedoes at the ship. We just need to either shoot them down while we scare them away formation, or we just need to scare them off. So Butch gets permission from the chain of command. They shove a radar inside of a Grumman Avenger. And now he starts developing night fighting tactics and his crew becomes known as the Black Panthers. So in November 1943, Wakanda? they go up to their first night mission, attempting to intercept Japanese bombers. They were unable to find the Japanese. Japanese bombers at night. However, they didn't get to shoot off their torpedoes and they got all the planes back on the carrier under the cover of night. So it was deemed a pretty big success. Then November 27th, 1943, they go up for their second night mission. There's two Avengers and four Hellcats divided into two different groups and they are going to go up there and stop the Japanese bombers. By the time all the American planes get up in the air, the Japanese bombers are so close that the Avengers are having trouble differentiating the radar signatures between the Japanese bombers and the American Hellcats. And before Butch and his wingman can actually find their avenger and get into formation butch's avenger actually runs into the mm. japanese bombers first and opens fire even though it's not a fighter it does have some guns but it's not a lot regardless they're able to shoot down one of the japanese bombers and then butch's avenger again somehow runs into another japanese bomber before finding butch and the wingman and it shoots that one down too mm. at this point it's chaos there's multiple planes in the air american and japanese and they're in close proximity and they don't know who is who so butch instructs his wingman and the avenger to both turn on their cabin lights at the same time so all three of them can see each other for a brief moment and they be able to get off. into formation so they turn the cab lights on for a brief second they all see each other then they turn them back off right away at this point the crew of the avengers spots a japanese bomber above butch approaching him from the rear most likely oh, no. attempting to shoot him down they radio to butch that he has somebody on his tail and they radio to the other hellcat to send them forward to take out the bomber butch's wingman in the hellcat speeds up intercepts the bomber opens fire and the bomber opens fire on butch the bomber takes heavy damage and veers off into the mm -hmm. darkness at which point the crew and the avenger radios butch we got him did i hear anything back though butch we got him come in over and there's nothing nobody knows exactly what happened but it is believed that the bombing crew got a lucky shot off that pierced butch's canopy killing him directly without heavily damaging his plane it is the only thing that would explain why he didn't radio that he had been hit despite extraordinary efforts his remains were never recovered and he was declared dead one year later in addition to butch o'hare six more american pilots would give their lives conducting carrier-based night operations during world war ii utilizing the techniques that Butch O'Hare had helped develop. Those missions are credited- Hey man, he was up there with the team though. He wasn't backing down. They tried to put him on a boat, say, hey, you stay here. He's like, now nah, I'm with my people, okay? with downing 103 Japanese planes that otherwise would have been able to attack defenseless American ships. Butch not only saved lives through his direct actions in combat, but through his expert training of the next generation of naval aviators in mm. World War II and his help developing groundbreaking techniques like the thatch weave and carrier-based night combat. In conclusion, this is why the airport in Chicago is known...
I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. It was O'Hare International Airport. It's named after a famous man named Edward O'Hare. And no, not, not the his famous dad. mafia lawyer <laughs> that had ties to Al Capone and was famously assassinated, but rather his son, the man that overcame the sins of his That's so crazy that both of those is in the same bloodline. So, like, you probably got people who argue one way, one people. But listen, this, hey, we, we, uh, if one thing we know about the U.S., okay, we know who is named after. Father to become one of the greatest war heroes in American history. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Hold on, there's no, no after? We were out there. Tell us about what happened in the, in the Pacific that February afternoon. We were out there and uh, we ran into a bunch of these Jap bombers. And we uh, think we did pretty good with them. Are you thinking of yourself or hitting the other folks? Well, you don't have much time to think about yourself. The main thing you... Bruh, he was almost out of there, bruh. This is like the second or third story we heard somebody. They was doing excellent, all right? You know what I'm saying? We're waiting to get they happy ever after. And then worry about is whether you can stop them before they get to your ship. Because if you don't, why, well, you won't have any place to go when you do finish up. Bruh. I hate it when I. Legend, 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 boy. That boy was cooking, I ain't gonna lie. He was cooking. Y'all let me know how y'all feel about this story down below. This this makes me want to get into, like, not World of Tanks. What's the other one with the planes? I want to. I don't know. I, I want to play it with, like, a team of people. And see if I could get good at it, okay? Because I never really played... The only military games I've ever played were, like, obviously army-based games where you're, like, your feet are on the ground, you know what I'm saying? Never, like, boats, planes, stuff like that. But ain't none of y'all trying to see me in Battleship, though. I do know that. Listen, get 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 pull out the board game. Let's play some Battleship. And I, I'm cooking, okay? I'm cooking that. Top, top five board game. And guess. I know y'all. I know y'all remember that one. But listen... Fat electrician with another banquet. Make sure y'all like, comment, subscribe, all that great stuff. And until the next time I see you, peace. So when the metal hit his mug, he just sunk in place. 100K holla, chillin' Bahamas. Come home to your crib and throw in your mama.